in this is only one chapter uh, in Philemon, so turn to uh, verses 15 to 17 in this letter. And stand with me, if you would, as I read these to you. These are sort of, as we've done all through this study, trying to find what we would call the, the essence, the, the descriptive verses that sort of capture something of the, of the uh, intent of the letter. It's a, this letter takes up the issue of the gospel and forgiveness. Paul writes to this friend. For this perhaps is why he, and you're going to find out that he is Onesimus, the slave of Philemon, why he is, was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Uh, fascinating what Paul is communicating to his friend here and how to receive a, a runaway slave who has become a follower of Christ. What have we just read? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God, and I pray the Lord will, will press to us tonight and open our eyes tonight to benefit in a maximum way from this brief uh, letter. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, we're going to watch the uh, gospel, the Bible project video of uh, Philemon, and then we'll get into the study of it. Paul's letter to Philemon. It was written during one of Paul's many imprisonments, and it's actually his shortest letter in the New Testament, but don't let its size trick you. It's actually one of the most explosive things that Paul ever wrote. Here's the backstory that we can piece together from details within the letter. Philemon was a well-to-do Roman citizen from Colossae who likely met Paul during his mission in Ephesus, and he became a follower of Jesus. Then later, when Paul's co-worker Epaphras started a Jesus community in Colossae, Philemon became a leader of a church that met in his house. Now, Philemon, like all household patriarchs in the Roman world, owned slaves, one of whom was named Onesimus. And at some point, these two had a serious conflict. Onesimus wronged Philemon in some way. Maybe it was theft, or maybe he cheated him. We don't exactly know. But afterwards, Onesimus ran away. Eventually, Onesimus came to Paul in prison, likely to appeal for help. And in the process, he became a follower of Jesus and then a beloved assistant of Paul. And so Paul finds himself in a very difficult and delicate situation as he writes this letter. He's going to ask Philemon not just to forgive Onesimus and receive him back, but to embrace him as a brother in the Messiah and no longer as a slave. Here's how he does it. Paul opens with a prayer, first praising Philemon and thanking God for the love and faithfulness he's shown to Jesus, to his people. And he then paves the way for his request with this line, I pray that the partnership that springs from your faith may effectively lead you to recognize all the good things that work in us, leading us into the Messiah. Now, a key word here is partnership, or in Greek, koinonia. It means sharing or mutual participation. It's when two or more people receive something together and share in it, becoming partners. Paul's saying that faithfulness to Jesus means recognizing that all of his followers are equal partners who share together in the gift of God's love and grace. And for Paul, this experience of koinonia among Jesus' followers, it's not just an idea that you think about, it's something that you do in your relationships, which moves Paul on to his request. He finally brings up Onesimus. He says that he's become Paul's child in prison, meaning that Paul led Onesimus to dedicate his life and allegiance to Jesus, and so Paul and Onesimus are now family members in the Messiah. He's been serving Paul faithfully in prison, and even though Paul wants to keep him around, he knows that this unresolved conflict with Philemon has to be reconciled if they say that they're followers of Jesus. Which moves Paul on to his bold request, that Philemon receive Onesimus back, no longer as a slave, but as more than a slave, as a beloved brother in the Lord. 
Now, this is a really tall order. Under Roman law, Philemon had every legal right to have Onesimus punished or put in prison. And Paul's not only asking him to forgive Onesimus, but to welcome back his former slave into Colossae as a social equal, as a family member. This is way more than kindness. This is unheard of. It's freeing a slave and then treating them like a family member. It upsets the status quo of the Roman social order. Why should Philemon do such a thing? And here Paul pulls a brilliant move. He recalls that key word from the opening prayer. He says, if you're truly a partner with me, it's that Greek word koinonia again, then welcome Onesimus as if he were me. And if he's wronged you or owes you anything, charge it to me and I will repay it. So in this request, we see the heart of Paul's gospel message being acted out. It's first of all about reconciliation. It's just like he told the Corinthians. In the Messiah, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. So in this situation, Paul is putting himself in the place of Jesus. He will absorb the consequences of Onesimus' wrongdoing. He will pay the cost so that he can be reconciled to Philemon. But Paul's message was about more than just a legal transaction. It's also about koinonia. Onesimus and Philemon and Paul are all equals before God. They all share the same need for forgiveness. And so the ground is level before the cross, which means that Philemon and Onesimus can no longer relate to each other as master and slave. They're family members. They're brothers in the Messiah. Or as Paul told Philemon and the whole church of Colossae, in God's new family, people are not Greek or Jewish or circumcised or uncircumcised or foreigners or uncivilized or slave or free, but the Messiah is all and is in all people. Paul closes the letter stating his confidence that Philemon will do even more than Paul's requested. And he asks him to prepare a guest room because he wants to visit as soon as he gets out of prison. And then with some final greetings, Paul ends the letter. Paul's letter to Philemon is powerful for many reasons. It's the only letter where Paul doesn't explicitly mention Jesus' death or resurrection, and this is not an oversight. He doesn't need to explain the cross with words because he's demonstrating it through his actions. Paul's embodying here the meaning of the cross. He has made himself the place through which Onesimus and Philemon are reconciled to God and then to each other. This letter also shows us that the implications of the good news about Jesus, they are extremely personal and never private. The fact that Philemon and Onesimus are now brothers in the Messiah, it makes their master-slave relationship totally irrelevant. The family of Jesus' people is the place where all are equal recipients of God's grace. It's a new kind of society, or a new humanity, as he called it in the letter to the Colossians, where people's value and social status, it's not defined by race or gender or social or economic class. In the Messiah, there are simply new humans who are equal partners, who share together in God's healing mercy through Jesus. And that's what Paul's letter to Philemon is all about. Another good summary. At the, at the Bible Project. I hope you check them out on, on YouTube. There are, uh, they've got videos they're adding all the time, an over, overview or summary of the New Testament, how to study the Bible, uh, how to interpret the Bible, things like that. Very helpful uh, by and large. All right, uh, Philemon, it's about forgiveness, it's about the gospel, it's about reconciliation. It's, it really is, I don't, I don't know if you've ever encountered this or not, I don't know, if, uh, through the years I've had people uh, rail at me um, that you, you can't trust the Bible, you can't read the Bible because the Bible endorses slavery and what they're what they're saying, and they don't know they're saying, is that in the Bible there's stories about slaves. But this book, it seems to me, uh, needs to be better understood by people. To read this book and suggest that Paul is endorsing slavery is to miss it completely. He is calling Philemon up to the, you know, Paul said to the Ephesians that he, uh, that he made of the two one new man, that in Christ we are brothers and sisters. 
And, uh, and so this, it's, a great, it's a great book to read, great book to remember. Because I promise you, hostility to the gospel is not going to decrease. And with what's happening in the landscape on the whole uh, social justice movement, not so much from our friends who are pushing it within Christianity, but those people who are getting excited outside of Christianity because they see this happening, they're going to increasingly clamor for a, uh, a dismissing of the biblical text because of things like this. So let's, let's look at this. I told you last week, I think, that one of the people I read on this called, uh, called this letter, because it's so small, they said Paul's postcard to Philemon is the shortest and perhaps most intimate of all his letters. Uh, they went on to say it's a masterpiece of diplomacy, uh, and he's dealing with a real touchy issue, uh, human slavery. Of course, we heard in the, in the video that uh, apparently Onesimus had, he had wronged Philemon somehow uh, that caused him to leave, to run away. And if nothing else, his running away was against Roman law. And not only could he be uh, captured, arrested, uh, beaten, he could be executed if the slave master said, I want him killed for what he did. That was, the Romans were perfectly fine with that. He seems to come into contact with Paul, who was under a house arrest, as is described in Acts 28. We read about that earlier in looking at some of Paul's imprisonments. Um, it's during that time that Paul is uh, helped by the Lord to lead Philemon uh, to Christ. And so the bondservant relationship, it's, it's interesting when it says, more than a bondservant. In other words, his, his commitment and responsibility to you are greater even than they were as your slave, is what he's saying. So let's look at a brief outline, then we'll look at the outline a little extended as we've been doing through all of these. Uh, the place of writing was from Rome. Uh, he wrote uh, from one of his Roman, in his house arrest, Roman imprisonment, it seems. It seems like the people were able to come and go and visit him. Uh, the date would be 60 to 61 A.D. Uh, he opens up, as we've already been told, uh, about the, uh, uh, a prayer of thanksgiving for Philemon and for their, <clears throat> excuse me, their partnership uh, in the gospel. He commends the love that Philemon has shown to him, and, and he's moving in this direction to basically say, and I trust that you will do the same to this new brother in Christ you have. Um, he appeals to uh, uh, this petition is on the basis of the conversion of Onesimus, and then he makes a promise to Philemon. And this is where, the, I appreciated them bringing this out in the video. This is where the gospel is set forth. Paul basically says, I will pay his debt. Put his debt on me. And that's exactly what Jesus did for sinners. And so he models the implications of the gospel. And he also uh, tells Onesimus, he has confidence that Onesimus will do the right thing. There's only... Uh, 334 words that comprise this letter in the Greek text. And uh, Paul is kind in it. Uh, he, does not, he does not flex his uh, apostolic authority. And we've seen him do that in some of the Corinthian correspondence and some of the other things we've looked at. He's not flexing that here with Philemon. He's appealing to the, to the, to the partnership, to the koinonia they share uh, in the gospel. And I'll give you the divisions. We'll dig down a little deeper. Uh, Paul writes this letter, if you look at the opening verses, as a prisoner of Christ Jesus, uh, verses 1 through 3. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and Timothy, our brother Timothy's with him at the time. To Philemon, our beloved fellow worker. And Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. So the church meets in Philemon's home. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on and tells him about the gratitude he has, that when he, when, when he thinks of Philemon, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. That's critical. Paul says, I've heard how you love the saints. It's going to become important when he introduces uh, Onesimus as a new believer, as now one of the saints. How you love all the saints. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. 
For I've derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. It's, it's, uh, it'll be radical in Colossae. It'll be radical in the Roman world for a master, slave master to have been wronged and show forgiveness to the slave. In the Roman mindset, that would be a sign of weakness. You would be, you would be inviting further rebellion, further uprising. So Paul is showing that the gospel uh, changes everything. So, so he extends this, uh, this prayer of thanksgiving for him. He makes this petition in verses 8 to 16. Uh, he does not notice. He doesn't command him. You, he doesn't say you're obligated. No. He doesn't, he doesn't take that approach with him. He commands him based upon what, he, what, how, what Philemon has shown in terms of his own Christian testimony. So he says in verses 8 and following, accordingly, though I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. If you're reading the letter as Onesimus, then you wonder what's coming. Paul, Paul could basically command me to do what he's about to ask, but he's, he's going to make an appeal. So what, what is happening here? And he says this, I, Paul, an old man. Again, he's talking, when he uses the term old man, he's, he's not, he's talking about his time is running out. He's, he's, he's aware that his time is running out. An old man. And now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus. So now you have this. Uh, someone suggested, and I think this is probably right. We talked about this a few Wednesdays ago in, uh, in prayer meetings. We were looking at the prayers of Paul. That, that Onesimus is probably the one who carried the letter back uh, to uh, to Philemon, and so he's come back, and he put yourself in his. He hands him a letter from Paul. So what is going on here? From my son Onesimus. And you can almost anticipate. You can almost imagine Onesimus saying, "Read this first. <laughs> read this first. here. This is from Paul. <laughs> read this first. And so uh, he's, he appeals for my child, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you." But now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Uh, whatever happened between them caused him to, to run away. If, if there was nothing else, at least the running away made him a useless slave, a, a trouble to the household. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf. Notice the language he's using. Onesimus didn't, Philip didn't send Onesimus to check on Paul. I could have, I could have kept him here uh, to serve me on your behalf. In, in your, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be compulsion, but of your own accord. So he goes on. And he says this. Might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, this perhaps is why he was parted from you. I think this is a fascinating part of the letter where Paul says, consider the providence of God here. You had a slave who was not compliant was not submitting to your being the master of the house. For this is perhaps why he was parted from you for a while. In order that, here's the purpose, you might have him back forever. No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant. As a beloved brother, he was a, he was a renegade. He was a lawbreaker when he left you. Now he's come back to you as a brother in Christ. Come back to a house, the house of a man who has a reputation for showing care and affection for all the saints. He says he's especially 
so to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And so he, he gives this uh, petition to Onesimus. And then the last section, he makes this promise. And this is, this is where the gospel just goes on display powerfully here. So if you consider me your partner, in other words, if you consider that we have koinonia with one another, we, we share in the gospel, receive him as you would receive me. Paul says, I know how you would act if I was standing there. You'd be gracious, you'd be overjoyed, uh, full of thanksgiving to God. So receive him as you would receive me. If he's wronged you at all, which is interesting, that makes us wonder what was going on there. Or owes you anything, charge that to my account. And then he does one of these things he does a few times in his right. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. And so, you know, scholars have debated, does this mean that, they would, that people familiar with Paul would have recognized his, his touch with the quill pen, perhaps? But it's a statement he's making that, that I'm writing this on my own. I will repay it. And then he says to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. In other words, Paul was instrumental in, 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 uh, in Philemon coming to faith in Christ. And his argument here is if you, and, and think about this, now just start, you may, you may have people in your life who have wronged you seriously. And to hear from someone who, to whom you owe uh, your, your Christian existence, humanly speaking, that the person who's wronged you seriously has come to faith in Christ. You have the real challenge at that point to practice what I, what I taught you 13 years ago, the first, the first Sunday night I stood and preached as your pastor, that reconciliation uh, is, is the one word, the one irreducible word of the gospel. You have the opportunity to show that grace is greater uh, than our sin and that love covers a multitude of sins. And so he's making these appeals to say nothing of you owing me your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. He says, basically, you want to bless me? Bless Onesimus. You want to bless me? Receive Onesimus as a fellow believer. Confident of your obedience, I write to you. Knowing that you will do even more than I say. He said, I, I'm writing this because I know that it, this, it won't stop with you in the bare minimum, you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers I will be gracious, graciously given to you. In other words, as you and the saints pray, that I'll be released from this. And if I'm released from this, I would love to visit Colossae. Meet with the church there in your house. And then he has these closing greetings. So, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, as so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So there's, there's, the, uh, there's the letter in its totality. Uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and, uh, and dig in now, uh, looking at some other portions. An introduction uh, and title as far as, well, uh, this, this book challenges the question does Christian brotherly love really work and in Paul's day for a for a, a an offended uh, aggrieved slave owner to receive back a runaway slave and forgive him that put on display in the Roman world how the gospel changes everything. It turns, it turns normal society upside down. Uh, you've seen the bumper sticker, uh, I don't get mad, I get even, the, the, the mentality that, uh, that I'm gonna, you wrong me, I'm gonna wrong you. The, uh, the, the, just, we, we've seen it on display. Wouldn't it be nice, I thought about this several times, 
some of these some of these things we see on TV, these political wranglings. Wouldn't it be nice if on if on both sides of an issue a Christ follower would rise up to speak and another Christ follower on the other side of the issue would rise up to speak and show the way forward that it doesn't have to be with vitriol it doesn't have to be vindictive it doesn't have to be uh, character assassination scorched earth politics I've, I've often thought about that uh, because the gospel does that and, and did that if you've read anything about the uh, the war between the states, there were times, uh, particularly when holidays approached, there was one I read about, the Christmas holiday, where the, where the uh, Union soldiers and the Confederate soldiers who were literally camped across a river from one another, preparing to fight one another again, stopped and sang uh, Christmas hymns and, and just had sort of a time of, of communion on Christmas Eve. Uh, I mean, it can happen. The gospel does impact that greatly and so that's that's what we're looking at when we read Philemon as far as the author uh, there its authorship has not been challenged really until until later centuries um, someone suggested that because that you, you can understand this because there is no reference to Jesus Christ death, burial, and resurrection, that it would be impossible for Paul to write such a letter and not mention that. Uh, but early church fathers, Jerome, uh, Chrysostom, uh, stepped forward, taking on those questions, and pretty much the, the, uh, apostles, uh, the authorship of Paul the Apostle uh, stepped forward. Let's look at some verses just to... Just to get a flavor for this. Look at Colossians chapter 4, uh, verse 9 and 10. It says, And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that's taken place. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Then again in Colossians 4, 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that, he may, that you may stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. Colossians 4:14, 4, a couple of verses down. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. You line, line these things up with the letter to Philemon, and you see the crossover there. Verse 10 of Philemon, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. And then verses 23 and 24. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, and we read that already. So you, you see the, the interlapping, uh, interlacing of the, uh, of the same names. And so it's generally recognized that this is Paul's letter. Uh, the date and setting, um, we've already talked about that some. Onesimus ran away. Why he found himself in Rome, we do not know. We do not know whether he was imprisoned and in God's providence found himself in a, in a similar arrangement where he had encountered or had access to Paul or whether he was in Rome and looked for Paul. He, he no doubt knew about Paul, being a, being a slave in the household and was probably around when Paul uh, was establishing the church in Colossae and was spending time with Philemon and preaching the gospel. So, so you know, you wonder, you let your imagination go a little bit. Did, uh, did Onesimus hear something that made him feel hopeful that if he sought out Paul that, that he too could experience this, this freedom that Paul had talked about that one encounters in Jesus Christ? Anyway, however, he came in contact with Paul. And Paul shared the gospel with him, and the Lord was pleased to save him. And then he stayed there a while. He, he ministered to Paul, uh, became an, a, something of an assistant, a helper. We've told you through all of Paul's writings, Paul never had enough help to do all that he was trying to do to advance the gospel. And so uh, Paul writes the letter to the church at Colossae, uh, possibly wrote this personal letter to Philemon, and then 
Onesimus, and Tychicus go to Colossae. Look at Colossians 4, 7 to 9. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is one with you. They will tell you of everything that's taken place. And so when Paul says, of course, in Philemon 12, I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. So, so he writes Colossae, the letter to the Colossians. He writes uh, the letter to uh, Philemon and sends them back. And, and so that helps you kind of understand how the situation was set up for Onesimus to be received by Philemon. Now, Philemon fits in as one of the four, what they call prison letters or prison epistles of Paul. <clears throat> that would include Ephesians, Philippians, uh, and Colossians. And we told you it's written about 60, 61 AD, uh, while Paul was in, under house arrest or in Rome, in that, a more loosely structured imprisonment. He's hopeful that he'll be released. He tells Philemon, prepare a guest room for me. And if, and if your prayers are heard, then I plan to come uh, and fellowship with you. Some have suggested that if, uh, that if Philemon was not converted uh, in Paul's labors in Colossae, that perhaps he was converted uh, in Ephesus during Paul's third missionary journey and then he and Paul labored to plant the church in Colossae. He had a wonderful reputation of being very benevolent uh, to the believers. Uh, Archippus is apparently his son. Uh, he is serving in leadership apparently in the church in, in Colossae. Uh, Onesimus may have had other slaves, probably did. And he probably was not the only slave holder among the, the people who'd come to Christ in Colossae. So you, again, you stop and you wonder, <clears throat> what was the ripple effect? You'd like to know that when, uh, when Onesimus went back and Philemon received him, how did that change the dynamic uh, in, in those slave-holding households in terms, of, in terms of their sharing the gospel with them? You may not know this, but one of the first catechisms written uh, by Baptists <clears throat> Baptist in the South was a catechism for the Negro. Uh, our Baptist brethren uh, wanted to teach the gospel to those uh, slaves that they had. Uh, there's, I'm not at all pretending to condone slavery. It was a horrible institution. It continues to be a horrible institution today in the Middle East and in North Africa. Uh, but you need to recognize within the, within the horror of slavery, there were godly followers of Christ trying to, to make the most out of this bad situation. I read one time, I think it was Richard, Richard Furman or Richard Fuller, one of our early Baptist fathers in, in the South Carolina area, <clears throat> Virginia area, who's, who, whose parents bequeathed to him 3,000 slaves. Now think about that a minute. It would be easy for people who didn't uh, have the responsibility for slaves to say, well, you should have just set them free. But I promise you, you set those people free who've been slaves, and you would have destroyed them. And so they recognized that as, though slavery had its, all its problems, uh, that you could, you could practice this in a benevolent way and share the gospel. And many people, many, many slaves came to Christ. The, the church that I pastored in Clinton, Louisiana, First Baptist Church, Clinton, Louisiana, started in 1836. When we dusted off one of their old record books while I was there, some of the minutes talked about uh, their membership. They had, they had X number of members who were, uh, who were white, uh, X number of members who were mixed, they had X number of members who were slaves. There was a man actually in the minutes excommunicated from the congregation for, for treating a slave severely. And he was restored to fellowship when he came back. Later on, you read it in, the, in subsequent minutes, where he repented to the congregation for being cruel to his slave and promised them that he would not do that again. And so so that's, that's the reality of what was happening uh, in Christian circles. 
And so you wonder, I, I, I just sit here and wonder, what happened to the church in Colossae when the Lord saved Onesimus? Paul sent him back with Tychicus to Philemon. Philemon receives him. What happened? It, it'd be fascinating to know that uh, somehow. So this gives us a uh, something of a guideline for how how do you and you pick it up. Uh, Paul talks about it in Ephesians and in Colossians as well about how uh, masters are to be be kind and benevolent and tender, uh, slaves are to be obedient. Uh, the gospel gives gives order and and as the gospel rises in the midst, then relationships change to where you're you're a brother, a sister in Christ. Well. As far as the theme and purpose, uh, one writer said that you have this, this picture from bondage to brotherhood, affected by Christian love. The theme of forgiveness. I was talking uh, recently in a, in a good conversation with a couple of young uh, believers. You know, what, what is, <clears throat> how do you mature? How does a young man in Christ mature in the faith? And it is, as you study the Gospels here, it is by practicing repentance, a willingness to repent. See, an unwillingness to repent is allowing pride to take over. A willingness to repent when we sin. A willingness to forgive when others sin against us. And I won't go into the full discussion we have, but we, we talked about the two different uh, platforms of forgiveness. One is a formal forgiveness, where, where when someone repents to you, uh, Jesus taught this, and they go, well, how often should I forgive my brother? If your brother sins against you, X times forgive him every time. So formal forgiveness. When someone repents, you forgive them. You don't have the, <clears throat> don't have the liberty, the prerogative as a believer, not to forgive somebody who repents to you. But there's also <clears throat> a, a, what I call a functional or an attitudinal forgiveness. And that is when someone sins against you that you be sure in your own heart to remind yourself that you have been forgiven a greater debt by the Lord Jesus than any, any debt they might owe you in the offense that they've, uh, they've administered to you. And so you, you act, you have a forgiving heart, praying for and longing for the day when, when you can uh, formally forgive in the face of repentance. And, but it's, so it's, it's, that, it's that practicing of repentance and forgiveness. And I told him, Acts 5, I think it's 5.23, says Jesus was exalted as prince and savior to give uh, repentance and forgiveness to Israel. And when you unpack that, we don't only repent of our sin when we come to faith in Christ initially. We, we repent and we believe the gospel, believe Jesus is, is the way, the truth, and the life, and the one who has who has borne the penalty for our sin and satisfied God's divine justice and wrath in our place, and then he rises from the grave to prove it infallibly. It's not just when we enter Christianity, but, but repentance continues. And as surely as repentance continues, and, and, and John says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we also practice forgiveness. Forgive as you've been forgiven, the scripture teaches. And so, so these, are, these are at the very heart of Christian maturity. And I would say to you that, that a person who is unwilling to repent, unwilling to consider their need to repent, this is critical in husband-wife relationships. So many marriage relationships just freeze over like, a, like a, a block of ice because there's not this regular practice of repentance and forgiveness. But it's, it's true in all relationships. And as we're doing that, we're growing as Christians because because that kind of practice, that kind of process, repentance and forgiveness, opens up the flow of the Spirit to teach us, to nurture us, be led by the Spirit. You can't be led by the Spirit if you harbor bitterness. And so we were talking about that, and this is what I see. Uh, Onesimus, repentance. Philemon's, forgiveness. And that's the, that's the thrust of this, of this letter. And no doubt it was, it was circulated around in the church at Colossae. But Paul has taught us something here. Paul has demonstrated for us a very practical application of the gospel in a society that was totally antagonistic to that idea. And then what about the keys? The keys to Philemon. Well, obviously we said that the, 
key phrase is the gospel and forgiveness. The verses we've already read, verses 15 to 17, I love in there where he, he says, consider the providence of God in all of this. He was an unruly slave when he was with you. He ran away in God's providence. He's come under the sway of the gospel and been saved, and he comes back to you now more useful, more compliant than he's ever been as a slave. He's a brother in Christ. And then what about, uh, how do we see Jesus in Philemon? Well, uh, this forgiveness motif again that you find in Christ fleshes itself out. Remember one of the, one of the oddest things Jesus says from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, we were talking about this. Those people who had crucified Jesus were not forgiven at that point. Jesus is not practicing formal forgiveness. He is demonstrating attitudinal forgiveness. Now, I say, how can you, how can you know that? Because you go to Pentecost when Peter's preaching. And he said, God raised him up, and you with wicked hands put him to death. And they interrupt his sermon and say, well, what must we do? We, we see what you're talking about. We, we're guilty. I mean, they're, they're, they're grieved. They're repenting. And so they experience the forgiveness of God then and become followers of Jesus. So this thing that Jesus says, and by the way, Stephen does the same thing when he's being stoned in the book of Acts. Father, do not lay this sin to their charge. So it's a, it's a very powerful picture that we, we lead as believers and we model Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ could say to those who were uh, crucifying him naked publicly, the most torturous way of execution uh, that had been devised up to that time, and how much more we are like him when we have that attitude of forgiveness against those who would do harm to us or who would slander us. And so you have this, uh, this picture here in Philemon 11. Paul says, formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. And then verse 18, if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. How? Much like Jesus Christ is that. Paul learns this from Christ. How gospel aroma comes from that. And then this saw. Uh, the spirit of reconciliation that, that comes when we're brought savingly to Christ. And by the way, when, when you encounter a professing Christian who's hardened, it's if you dig deep enough, it's because somewhere along the way they've stopped practicing repentance and forgiveness. And they've decided to close, close quarters, dig in, and protect themselves from further uh, hurt. And listen to this in, in Philemon 10 to 17. We've read it before. Let's just read it again here real quickly. Listen to Paul's love, his desire to intercede. His desire to reconcile. Again, reconciliation is the essence of the gospel. So look at him step in the, in the gap. Appeal to his, his partnership, his koinonia with Philemon. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. And we said the former, he, formerly he was useless to you, but now he's indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf. He says, I know that you would, you would want me to have all the help that I, I can use during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent. Because you can imagine, let's suppose that Tychicus had brought the letter to the church at Colossae and a letter from Paul about what had happened to Onesimus, but no Onesimus. The physical appearance of Onesimus to uh, Philemon was important and critical for the reconciliation process to take place. In order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, 
but of your own accord. Face to face, he had the opportunity to, to forgive him. He could have said in a letter he forgave him, but n never had to experience the reality of the up-close uh, challenge of reconciliation. And he goes on to talk about the providence of God. This is perhaps why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but now, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, if you, if you, if you acknowledge that we have any shared koinonia in the faith, receive him as you would receive me. Paul is, in, in this letter, this personal thing, he He's not teaching theological construct, but he is powerfully modeling how the gospel changes everything. And he's setting himself forward. Look at, look at verse 8. Accordingly, though I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do what's required, uh, he didn't. I appeal to you. And he becomes Onesimus' substitute. This is the, this is the substitutionary atonement of Christ. It's modeled by Paul uh, in 18 and 19. If he's wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Just consider, if, if, in other words, if he stole from you, I'll pay it back. I'll take care of that. And this is me, Paul. This is not someone speaking for me. This is not someone saying, I think Paul would want you to. No, this is me, Paul. I will repay it. And then he says, and I think this is interesting what he says. He says to say nothing, but he does say it, okay? To say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. I know you would receive it from me because of the relationship we have. And so, again, Jesus Christ, though not mentioned in this letter, the, the spirit of Jesus Christ is all over this letter in terms of the transforming power of the gospel and how it works itself out in human relationships Paul has given Philemon the opportunity to prove that he's one who's been forgiven of his sin by Jesus forgiven a great debt by Jesus and will forgive others who owe him by virtue of in this case uh, disobedience insubordination And so he, one writer said this. He said, in, as you read this, in this analogy, we are as Onesimus. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We were slaves to the prince of the power of the air. Jesus has forgiven us. And so there, if you, if you get, get a little uh, sanctified imagination, there, standing with Philemon, is Tychicus and Onesimus and a letter. And he had the opportunity to, uh, the famous thing, what would Jesus do? The opportunity to practice Christ's likeness in forgiving. Onesimus, one writer said, was condemned by law, but saved by grace. What about the contribution of this, of this smallest of letters of the Apostle Paul? What's its contribution in the biblical literature, in the Bible? Well, you're, you're compelled by how personal it is. How persuasive, when you think about gospel implications, the gospel really does, it may, it may not move the unconverted, but it persuades believers. People who are true believers are, are persuaded and moved by the gospel. You're impressed by the way that, that Paul handles this. Not heavy-handedly, not in, in a mealy-mouthed way. He stays focused and on point. Here's what the gospel shows. Here's how people respond to the gospel. Here you have an opportunity. I'm, I'm confident that you will even do more than I have written because he believes that, that Philemon is a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. He's seen that in their labors together. 
One writer said this, he said, it's amazing how in this letter, and he says in other letters, Paul takes the highest gospel principles and applies them to the most mundane matters. But that's the beauty of the practicality of the gospel. It's not, it's not an idea meant to be debated in, 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 the, in the ivory towers. It's, it's, a, it's a message that transforms people's lives and lived at the, at the most nitty-gritty levels of human existence, of human relationships. If, if the gospel, you show me a marriage where the gospel principles like this are applied, I'll show you a marriage that the devil could not touch with any weapon he has. Same thing for churches. One writer suggested when Paul says, I'm, I'm writing this in my own hand, that he wrote the entire letter in his own hand. Isn't that possible? But he wanted it to be, he wanted to be personal, intimate. <clears throat> he wanted to get a hearing with Philemon. And writing in his own hand would, would, would raise the bar on how important and urgent the request he's making is. He does not sugarcoat Onesimus' offense. He doesn't say, hey, nobody's perfect. You know, sometimes slaves get beside them. He doesn't. doesn't sugarcoat it at all. <clears throat> Which, by the way, is, I think, a good lesson for, for churches when you're dealing with things. I mean, we're, what we're dealing with now on Sunday mornings, there are probably some people that would get offended that we're just talking as plainly as we are. But what you don't get anywhere by sugarcoating things. You speak lovingly, plainly, redemptively. And that's what Paul is doing here in, in a marvelous way. One writer said, Philemon was not written to impart doctrine, but to apply doctrine in such a way that the life-changing effects of Christianity would have an impact on social conditions. This is social justice, if there is such a thing. How the gospel applies to these conditions. You don't hear anything at all in here about how terrible slavery is and how how Philemon and everybody who's ever owned a slave and everybody in Philemon's household owes reparations to, to Onesimus. And, and how, you don't hear victimology here like you do in the, in the arguments being made today. You hear gospel reality here. It's a great way to go forward. The power of the gospel overcomes sociological barriers. We'll, we'll wrap this up reading a few verses. Look at Galatians 3, 28. You know this verse been abused but it's a great truth there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither slave nor free there is no male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus Paul is not saying there that gender identity is up for grabs what he is saying there is in the Roman culture where where Jews carried on a certain way that made Greeks uh, despised people, and where Greeks did the same toward Jews, where slaves were under the thumb of, of, of taskmasters, of harsh slave masters, where females were treated like second-class citizens, that all those social structures disappear, not, not biblical functions, social structures disappear. And in their place come, come this gospel uh, preciousness. You show me a husband who's willing to embrace the gospel and love his wife as Christ loves the church, I'll show you a wife that wouldn't run away from that for anything in the world if she has any sensibility of her own uh, well-being. The same thing is true when you turn the, a wife who who submits to her husband as unto the Lord. You can run through all the relationships. The gospel makes these relationships precious. Colossians 3.11. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. And this is fascinating because this is in the letter that was delivered by Tychicus when, when Onesimus accompanied, accompanied him to go back to Colossae and give Paul's letter to Philemon. 
And so not only is this happening with these two, the church in Colossae is being taught there is neither slave nor free in Christ. When you think about the power of the gospel, here's a man in prison for the gospel who was one of the leading Pharisees, a student of Gamaliel, Hebrew of the Hebrews, Pharisee of the Pharisees when he gives his resume, sent out by the Sanhedrin to stamp out Christianity. And so this former self-righteous, bigoted Jewish Pharisee says, my son Onesimus. The gospel does that. And nothing else. So one writer, I'll close with this, said, while Philemon is not a direct attack on the institution of slavery, its Christian principles would ultimately lead to the disillusion of slavery. If we, if we win people to Christ and they become our brothers and sisters, then the relationship changes completely. So, so that's, uh, that's an overview of Philemon. Short book, powerful book, uh, great principles, gospel principles in it. Any questions or comments?